time to waste, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, a disclaimer, this talk is not about skyscrapers. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I know you're probably thinking like, but the very first slide, it said how to build a skyscraper, but I promise you this talk is not about skyscrapers. And it's really important that we remember this as we go through the talk. So for those of you who are on time, you're going to be like really confusing the other people that come in late because we have an exercise to do here. Anytime you see this slide, I'd like you to read it out loud. We're going to try that right now. This talk is not about skyscrapers. All right. But when I first started researching for this talk, I did find it really interesting when I started to read the descriptions of the considerations that you have whenever you do skyscraper design and construction. I think it's interesting anyway. So first skyscraper we're going to talk about doesn't even technically qualify as a skyscraper. It's the Equitable Life Building built in 1870. But to be fair, skyscraper is also a term that we've used for very tall horses, very tall men, and even very tall hats. So I think we can probably give a seven-story, 130-foot tall building a, a pass. Now, the Equitable Life Building was the tallest in the world from 1870 to 1884. And it was the headquarters of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, but that's a, a mouthful, so I'm just going to call them equitable. Now, they were a life assurance uh, society. They were a life insurance company is what that really is. Uh, so them being a life insurance co uh, company, they were experts at assessing risk. Now, they had determined that their building uh, was fireproof. We'll come to that, back to that uh, <laughs> a little bit later. Um, so its basement housed... Uh, safes and vaults that were filled with several billions, and I do mean billions, in 1870s era money of securities, stocks, and bonds. So put simply, this equitable building was the center of most of the wealth of New York, and in the New York Financial District specifically. And it really showed us, this building is gorgeous. And tenants in their building included bankers and lawyers, and it even had an exclusive lawyers club, which is what you see here. And really, it only had one problem. Can you spot it? It had stairs, and a lawyer on the seventh floor of the building was not going to have very many clients if they had to climb up six flights to get to him. So thankfully, a solution to this problem uh, did exist. Um, a guy by the name of Elisha Otis uh, was a tinkerer, he and his sons, actually. And at age 40, uh, in 1851, he was managing the process of converting a, uh, an abandoned sawmill into a bed frame factory. Now, while cleaning up, he had a reason that he needed to get all of his debris up to the upper floors of, of this factory. And uh, hoists and elevators existed, but they had one really important flaw, which was that if the rope broke, then anything that was on this hoist was likely broken or dead. Kind of an issue. So he and his sons designed what they called a safety hoist, and it wouldn't fall to the ground if the rope broke. And he didn't think too much of it. He didn't patent it. He didn't try to sell it. And he didn't even ask for a bonus for, for designing it. Uh, but three years later, the bed frame business was declining, and he was looking to try something new. Um, so he formed a, a company to, to sell his elevators, and he got no business for uh, several months. Now, the neat thing about these elevators is these teeth, right, on the side of the elevators, whenever the rope would break, the uh, spring would release its tension, and these, these pegs would shoot out into these teeth to stop the elevator from falling. So again, no business for several months. And then came the 1854 New York World's Fair. Now, he had a great opportunity to demonstrate the elevator in a really dramatic way, and he was a bit of a showman. So he gets up on one of these hoists, and he has an assistant cut the rope, and he's fine. Now, everybody, it's, it's kind of like NASCAR. Everybody's waiting to see the disaster, right, that's going to happen. But everything's fine. And I'd like to point out, too, that this is a charcoal drawing, but there's a photobomb in it. I'm not exactly <laughs> I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, so these elevators weren't perfect. Um, they ran on steam engines back in that day, and so that meant somebody had to keep them constantly fueled. But even though it would be a while before they were updated to run on electricity, it was a big deal. Um, you got to think about equitable here. It used to be that when you, uh, when you had an office building, because people didn't want to climb stairs, if you owned the building, you made the most money on that investment by renting out the lower floors. Uh, so a company would lease the space, uh, in the lower floors, and then make all of its employees go up, and, you know, climb, end up sweaty and a mess whenever they get up there. Speaking of which, how are those showers this morning, huh? Um, so <laughs> it, <laughs> now there's a safe way to travel easily to and from these higher floors. 
Um, and, you know, the highest floors also happen to have the perks of being the most well-lit, the most well-ventilated, the furthest away from road noise. Um, so this literally turned the, the value proposition for buildings upside down on their head. And all of this was the result of something Elisha Otis didn't even think was that big a deal. I'm just glad he shared it. But anyway, we were talking about the equitable building, you know, the, the one that was fireproof and uh, it had billions of dollars in its basement. This is uh, the Cafe Sauveron. Uh, it was a really fancy cafe in the equitable building. Now, picture that it's uh, January 9th, 1912, and it's just after 5 a.m., and the wind is howling with uh, gusts over, 40, over 68 miles per hour, and uh, it's making the below freezing temperatures even cooler. And Philip O'Brien, who was the timekeeper at the Cafe Sauveron at the time, had started his day by lighting the gas in his small office, and he distractedly throws the still-lit match into the garbage can. By 5.18 a.m., the office is engulfed in flames. And the flames spread to the elevators and the dumbwaiter system and quickly engulfed the entire building. And the fire department arrived, but as you can see here, it was so cold outside that as they're spraying the building down with water, it's freezing on the building. They literally can't put the fire out because it's turning to ice before it gets to the fire. So the building was completely ruined. And so it was that the building built as... <laughs> <laughs> and so it was that the building built as fireproof was lost in a fire. And history buffs out there might also remember that 1912 was a year that uh, uh, an unsinkable ship struck an iceberg and, and sank as well. You know, you'd think two, two disasters in one year uh, would be enough to teach us we, maybe we shouldn't be making these grandiose statements anymore. But again, <laughs> next skyscraper we're going to talk about is the Home Insurance Building. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was built in 1885. Uh, the architect was William LeBaron Jenny. And the, uh, the story goes that uh, Jenny left uh, work unusually early uh, one day, and his wife thought perhaps he was sick, and she, she rushed to meet him at the door, and she took this heavy book that she had, and she sat it on a bird cage. And inspiration struck Jenny when he got there, and he said, if so frail a frame of wire would sustain so great a weight without yielding, would not a cage of iron or steel serve as a frame for a building? I'm not quite sure why it kind of sort of rhymed. That's very poetic if he really did say that, but we're going to go with it. So... The Home Insurance Building is considered the father of the skyscraper by most, and it was the tallest in the world until 1889. Uh, it was built from cast iron columns and rolled iron beams uh, for the framework up to the sixth floor, and then from that floor up, it was steel beams. Now, the majority of the masonry that was used uh, was actually hung from the framework like a curtain. So in construction like this, the, the masonry was there to look pretty, to keep the weather out, to keep the people in, that sort of thing. Um, but the heavy lifting was done by the framework. And this made the building drastically lighter and uh, to the tune of about one-third the weight of a typical load-bearing masonry uh, building. So something as simple as a birdcage led to an idea that was going to revolutionize everything about how we went on to build tall buildings from this point forward. But you may have noticed I said that the, the majority of the masonry was, wasn't load-bearing, and since there was still some load-bearing masonry in, in, the, in the building, it left things open to debate. And so the end result was that if you were from New York, you said, well, you know, the home insurance building really isn't the first skyscraper. But if you were from Chicago, you certainly did think that this building was the uh, first skyscraper. But, you know, the interesting thing about this is here are these people in Chicago, and they've built this awesome building upon an iron and steel framework. And it's clearly a technical accomplishment. And more importantly, it's, it's serving the needs of their occupants. Uh, but it was so easy for people to come along after the fact and sort of debate, well, you know, it's not really that impressive. So this is Leroy Buffington. He doesn't look very happy, does he? Uh, maybe that's because he claimed he had the same idea for this framework sort of design in 1881, except he didn't build it. He did, however, apply for a patent for it uh, in November of 1887, and it was granted in May of 1888. Now, by this point, the technique's already in wide use. But still, Buffington started a company he called the Iron Building Company for the express purpose of pursuing lawsuits. <laughs> now, this is a flax mill uh, that used iron framing. This was built in 1797. It sort of sounds like prior art to me. Um, but that didn't really stop Buffington from trying to extract money from anyone who was going to pay. But again, <laughs> I like, you know, for post-lunch, this is impressive. I love you people. So the next building we're going to talk about is the Monatnock Building, built in 1891 in Chicago, Illinois. 
Uh, so there were these two brothers, uh, wealthy brothers. I could only find a, uh, a picture of one of them, uh, Peter Brooks. But Peter and Shepard Brooks uh, believed Chicago was going to be America's largest city. And you can tell Peter was rich because they don't do oil paintings of people that aren't rich, I find. Um, they hired this guy on the right, Owen F. Aldis, to be their property manager. And Peter only ever visited Chicago one time. Uh, the brothers relied on Aldis to, to do all of the heavy lifting, figure out, figure out what they were going to do. So Aldis recommended that they uh, retain Daniel Burnham and John Root of the very imaginatively named uh, Burnham and Root uh, to design this building. Now, Burnham was a pragmatic businessman, but Root was a bit of an artist. He had a flair for the artistic. This is a sketch from 1885 that was drawn by Root. Um, it, this was, at this time, the building was planned to be 13 stories, and it had this sort of Egyptian-inspired ornamentation that you can see up here. Now, Peter Brooks was known not only for being very wealthy, but also for being very stingy, and he preferred simplicity. And in fact, he insisted that the artists refrain from any kind of elaborate ornamentation. He said, in fact, he didn't want anything to pr protrude at all because it was just going to create a place for pigeons to nest. He really, I get, he really had a problem with pigeons. Um, so when Root goes on vacation, Burnham, the business guy, uh, has another just a draftsman create a simpler drawing. You might imagine that when Root came back from vacation, he wasn't terribly pleased. Here was this artistic work that he had done that was being gutted, essentially. Now, he did eventually, however, decide to throw himself into the design, and he, he, he found a way to kind of get invested. Uh, he declared that the heavy lines of the Egyptian pyramids had captured his imagination and that he would throw the thing up without a single ornament. So by embracing this constraint that, that Brooks had uh, provided instead of fighting it, he was able to find a way to remain invested and passionate about his work. So this is the sketch four years later in 1889. Um, you can see Root really, he can't quite give up entirely on a little bit of ornamentation, but he has these little protrusions that stick out along the way, these little bumps that you can see. But Aldous was able to sell Brooks on the idea because uh, these protruding windows would increase the square footage they could rent. So in fact, the height of the building was calculated by determining how high can we actually get away with building this thing while still having enough room to rent because this was load-bearing masonry. So by the time you got down to the bottom of the walls, these walls were six feet thick. So you imagine you keep going higher, you lose rentable space. There's a, you can run it through an equation, figure out how to optimize. Um, so Chicago also had soft soil, so they had to devise a special raft system that kind of floats the building on top of the soil. So this is the, the finished product. Uh, it's uh, 215 feet tall, 17 stories. Uh, it was the tallest of any commercial structure in the world at the time. Now, they, they knew that the building was going to settle. Uh, they designed it to settle eight inches, but by 1905, it had settled that much and quite a bit more. Uh, they ended up having to reconstruct the first floor. By 1948, uh, it had settled 20 inches, and so they actually had to put a step down. So you, to get into the building now, you step down to go in because it's gradually sinking. And guess what? It, <laughs> it's, found, it's found to be sinking in 1967. I, they forgot it already was, I guess. Um, so... Profitability is a really important factor to consider, but it can't be the only thing that you consider while you're building your building. Again, all right. Next skyscraper we're going to talk about is the Fuller Flatiron, 1902. Uh, so during the construction of the Manatnik, uh, John Root passed away. Um, Daniel Burnham was still in business. Uh, he had D.H. Burnham and Company, and he partnered with a guy by the name of Frederick Dinkelberg to... Uh, to build or to design the Fuller Flatiron Building. Now, the Fuller Flatiron was originally supposed to be called just the, the Fuller Building after uh, the recently deceased George A. Fuller. He, Fuller, he was a, a kind of a big deal in the architecture community. Uh, but locals called it the Flatiron. Now, I assumed like, oh, it's because it's like iron, it's made out of iron or you know something to that effect. But as it turns out, it was much simpler than that. The building looked like a Flatiron. And at the tip, it was only six and a half feet wide. The shape of the plot of land they had, this triangular uh, plot of land, it necessitated a, a different kind of shape for the building. And if the Manatnik required walls that were six feet wide at the base, you might imagine that's not going to work whenever you're six and a half feet wide for the entire building at the tip. Um, and it was only 16 stories tall, so this is even a taller building. Um, so at this point, that's obviously not the case. You can see that they're not six feet wide, they're not six feet wide walls. Um, so since it was better to have an oddly shaped building than, than half a building, Burnham and uh, Dinkelberg had, had adapted their approach so that they could fit the space that they were given. And this meant choosing some new materials, and in this case it was all steel. 
It was not masonry at all. So the flat iron was built on an all steel frame. Now, if you look at these photos, uh, you might not be terribly surprised to hear that the locals were calling this building Burnham's Folly. And in fact, they were actually taking bets on how far the building's debris was going to blow when the building toppled over during the, the, the windstorms that would hit. <laughs> so, but you know, there was an engineer, his name was Corden Purdy, Purdy and uh, he was involved in this product, project. And he had designed bracing that had already been tested to withstand four times the wind this building was ever going to encounter. And so it was after this building went up, during uh, the first windstorm that hit very shortly after, it was 60 mile per hour winds. Uh, and the tenants were saying they couldn't feel the slightest vibration in the building. And not only that, one even said that the filament in his light bulb didn't even quiver whenever they had this windstorm. And so this didn't surprise the engineers one bit. They had run their tests. They knew what was going on. But it really blew everybody else away. But again... So this is a twofer. We're going to talk about two skyscrapers at once. They both went up in New York, and we're going to talk about 40 Wall Street and the Chrysler building. Now, H. Craig Severance and William Van Allen were formerly partners at another uh, architecture firm. And they were very different personalities. Um, Van Allen was, again, an artist. He was the type of guy that liked to hang out with other architects and discuss the finer points of design. And Root uh, it was very much like him. There's, there's this pattern you see of these kind of pairings of a business person and, uh, and an artist. Um, but Severance, on the other hand, uh, he spent his time with the business folks, and he was drumming up sales. Uh, you, you might be able to tell here, humility wasn't exactly his, his strong suit. Um, and he didn't really have a particular passion for architecture as art. Uh, but still, whenever the trade magazines would all refer to Van Allen as this, this great designer, this very impressive person, and they didn't really mention Severance at all uh, for the buildings that they designed together, um, it, he took it personally. And their partnership, as you might imagine, uh, ended badly. And then, to make things worse, they found themselves in competition with one another. So Severance had been commissioned to design 40 Wall Street, but Van Allen uh, was commissioned to design the Chrysler building at the same time. Now, you might already, you're probably already familiar with the Chrysler building, but I talk to people regularly that don't know what I'm talking about when I say 40 Wall Street. So maybe this will actually help. Um, we, call this, we, we call this the Trump building today. Uh, back then it was known as the Bank of Manhattan Trust building. So Severance had assembled a bit of a dream team. It consisted of his associate, associate uh, Yasuo Matsui and consulting architect Shreve and Lamb to design 40 Wall Street. Now, Walter Chrysler had Van Allen design the Chrysler building for his car company, but he paid for it all himself because he wanted to leave the building to his children one day. And he was obsessed of every single detail of this building because he later referred to it as a monument to me. Um, so the Chrysler building was announced a month earlier than, than the building Severance was working on. So you might not be terribly surprised then that, that the 40 wall was announced as a bit higher, right? Um, so in October of 1929, Severance is visiting the, the site of his construction, and his building's just about to catch up with the Chrysler building, and he's feeling pretty good about things because Chrysler building's slowing down now. They're putting these domes on the top that you, you, you probably would recognize, and, uh, you know, they can't go much higher. Now, Chrysler was in the, uh, already in the process of drumming up press for his building, so he was announcing that the steelwork was complete, which would have made Chrysler, the Chrysler building the tallest one uh, in the world at the time at a revised height of 850 feet. Um, but Severance wasn't really worried. He had already put in motion plans to build higher than announced, and this was once. So the month was filled with all sorts of announcements from other builders, and uh, everyone was claiming uh, that they would build something larger. In fact, there were people saying, well, there's nothing really stopping us from building a building that was two miles tall. Um, so Van Allen was silent. He, Chrysler, and a very few other people knew that they were going to build a lot higher than anyone was expecting. So in the third week of October, Severance hears about uh, the sighting of a 60-foot flagpole uh, at the top of the Chrysler building, and so he raises his plans again. And this was enough uh, when they leaked this information to the press to declare that the Bank of Manhattan Trust building was, in fact, going to be the one that would top out the tallest. Um, and, then, you know, it just it made sense, right, because the Chrysler building couldn't go much higher. And so they, they knew that the, Chrysler, or the Manhattan uh, Trust building was going to be 925 feet. Chrysler building would be 905 feet. And this was all including that flagpole. Only the flagpole wasn't a flagpole. The flagpole was just one part of a five-part, 185-foot, 27-ton steel spire that Van Allen named the Vertex. And he had had it built in the off-site in all these five pieces. And then he shipped each part 
separately to the building. And then they hoisted them into the dome's fire tower on the 65th floor. So then they partially assembled them, hoist the base up, rivet all the rest of the pieces in place in about 90 minutes. So Van Allen and Chrysler go to bed this evening knowing they have the tallest building in the world. But the best part is nobody else actually noticed because from the ground, this stuff kind of just looked like a really tall crane or something attached to the building. And so they just kept quiet because, you know, Severance can keep on going if he wants. So let's just keep it quiet for a little while. And so when 40 Wall Street tops out uh, in November, the uh, New York world runs with this headline. And they aren't talking about the Chrysler building, but they're talking about 40 Wall. And four days later, this kind of uninteresting trade magazine that called the Daily Building Report from the Dow Service. It's normally running things like what are the costs of building materials all around the country so you can optimize for that kind of stuff. They break this news, this dramatic news, that the Chrysler Building is over 238 feet taller than anybody really knew they were building. And so after all was said and done, um, the Chrysler Building uh, was towering over 40 Wall Street by over 100 feet, and it became the tallest man-made structure that was ever built. It, it, this beat out even the Eiffel Tower, which had been the tallest man-made structure up to this point. But both of these buildings cost a fortune. I mean, you got 13 mil on one side, 14 mil on the other. Think for a moment about how much extra expense uh, was incurred on these buildings and just because they were trying to win against a rival. To make things worse for the winner, Chrysler refused to pay Van Allen his 6% design fee after they finished this work. Um, that would have $840,000 that he stiffs this architect because the architect hadn't quite been bright enough to enter into a legally binding contract uh, when he received the commission to, to build the Chrysler building. And, you know, Chrysler would have paid anything up until the point this building was completed and he had won the title to reach this height. But after that, it just didn't really seem like it was worth it. Van Allen had to sue him to get paid, uh, which ended up making him a bit of a, a cautionary tale to other architects. And in fact, uh, no major studies have really been de devoted to this day, to Van Allen's work, um, and he's little known in the history of architecture. On his death, the New York Times didn't even publish his obit. Again. So another neat skyscraper is the Empire State Building. Um, again, we're talking about New York here. Back in August of uh, 1929, this is during the construction of the two buildings we just discussed, rumors started circulating that uh, a new developer was going to take ownership of the site of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Uh, now, Al Smith was the former New York governor that was running against Herbert Hoover for the presidency. And he had invited John Raskob to chair the uh, Democratic National Convention after Raskob uh, had been running his campaign. Well, Raskob was VP of uh, finance for GM and uh, until eight, 1928 when he got ousted. Uh, by a guy by the name of Al Sloan, who was a supporter of Hoover and claimed there was a conflict of interest here. So he asked him out of the company. Well, Raskob's like, okay, fine, whatever. He sells his GM stock. Uh, he wants to finance a building. He creates the Empire State Company, and he hires Al Smith to, to be the president of it. So Al Smith um, is a politician, right? He has a flair for the dramatic. Um, this is how he announced that he was going to be the president of the, the, build, of the company and that he was going to build this building. And, of course, he announced that it was going to be an 80-story skyscraper, the, the tallest in the world. Uh, but, again, this is, this is around the same time that everybody else is making these grand claims of, like, two-mile tall buildings. So nobody's paying attention. Um, so speaking of these months, remember Shreve and Lamb, they were the consulting architects that were brought on to work on 40 Wall Street. Um, during the same time, uh, they teamed up with a guy, another guy by the name of Arthur Loomis Harmon. And uh, by, uh, I think it was October 2nd, uh, 1929, they were already showing scale models of this, this new building, the Empire State Building, um, to, uh, to Raskob. And uh, I, I think that's really interesting because these other buildings hadn't even been done, so they sort of had some insider information about what was going on. Um, and now Lamb was, again, Lamb was an artist, uh, very much like Van Allen and John Root before him. But, uh, and his partnership with uh, Shreve was very much, Shreve was the business guy. Now, the thing about this is, um, he was also pragmatic enough to know that there were certain concessions he was going to have to make, even though he had a flair for the artistic. And, you know, he had a tight deadline, and that was going to be the primary constraint that he was going to have to deal with. Now, initial drawings for this, uh, this building were created within two weeks, and uh, final design was reaching four. This is, like, really fast. Uh, and one of the things they did that was really interesting is instead of designing from the bottom up, they designed from the top down. Um, they set a standard for light in the interiors, and this was the thing that they said they weren't going to compromise on. They wanted to place a standard on how pleasant it would be to work in the, in the spaces that they were building. 
And, you know, Lamb had his priorities straight. He, he understood that certain things had to be constants, and everything else was going to have to shift around those things. He wasn't willing to sacrifice lighting, ventilation, anything else that was going to make the property valuable and appreciated by those people who mattered. Well, who matters? Right? They're the present and they're the future occupants of your building. They're people like her. They're people like him. They're people like this guy because if the building can't be maintained, it's not going to be very good for very long. Uh, the, occupants can come in all shapes and sizes. But one, one thing is for sure, just because someone is big, strong, loud, and they want to use your building to make themselves bigger and stronger and louder, that doesn't mean that you should put their needs above the greater good. So one reason the building's designs uh, took shape so quickly was that they were able to use parts of designs that had been done before. Uh, this is the Reynolds Building in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It was designed by Shreve and Lamb previously. And this is Carew Tower in Cincinnati, Ohio, designed by another firm. If you look at the scale models side by side, you can see that there were aspects of the design that were sort of swiped from both of these other pre-existing pre designs. And it's great to be able to reuse previous work because it can, it can make your work go much faster. So fast forward to November uh, of 1929. Al Smith has just announced that they've also bought the adjoining land to the Wal Waldorf Astoria, which of course the news uh, people are now recognizing, well, this means they're building higher. Um, now, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, they all wanted to keep the height down to be practical because the higher you went, eventually you even had to have people get out and change elevators, right? They can't just ride one elevator up to the top. They have to get out, walk around, and change elevators. That's fine and good, but Raskob's the guy that's paying for this, and he wants to add more height to Empire State. And so the next day, Al Smith, in his typical fashion, announces that they're going to add five more floors. He announces the new title. The new total is going to be 85 stories and 1,100 feet. That's an overestimate by about 50 feet. But you know, he's not the tech guy. It's OK. <laughs> All right? So I love this, though. I, I, I love that uh, this is what, the, what the, the actual architects are saying. We want to do sound development of, of usable space. So John Raskob, he's sitting in his office, and he's looking at this scale model that they've provided. And like every client ever in the history of ever, he decides he knows exactly how to solve this problem. And what he reportedly said at the time is that this building needs a hat. Now, he didn't mean a literal hat. What he meant was a mooring, a mooring post for zeppelins to be able to dock above the streets of New York City uh, and let passengers off at the top of Empire State so that they can then go down the building. And it was going to be so much better than the Chrysler building spire, because this had a, like a, a good purpose. And uh, it was going to need another 200 feet. And, you know, this is going to let them stay true to Shreve's promise that we're going to do the sound design of usable space. But you'll notice how Al Smith just happens to mention the final height of the building in, that, in his announcement about this, this new development. Now, never mind the feasibility of docking a, a Zeppelin at this height above New York City, or what was going to happen when the Zeppelin got caught by some wind gusts and needed to maintain even keel by dumping several hundred gallons of water on the people below. I, I want to remind you now, if you, you don't remember this from physics, water weighs about eight pounds a gallon. And so we're talking about well over a ton of water being dumped on citizens below the building. But Ras Raskov had to build the tallest building. None of this mattered. Now, this plan was going to add $750,000 to the, to the cost of these, this building. But because it had marketing appeal and because everybody was so enamored with flight at this era, uh, the architects had really no say on it at all. Raskov and Smith were determined it was going to happen. And so this frustrated Shreve. He wanted things to be practical. But in the end, they still had to go with it. Now, with the designs complete, it was time to start building. And the interesting thing about building is I don't care if you design from the top down, but you, you definitely need to build from the bottom up. When you build, everything that you build has to sit on top of something else. Now, your definition of bottom might change depending on you know, what you're building on top of. But the only way to make sure that the structure is going to be sound is that it's sitting on something else that's already sound. But it's important to be honest with yourself. If you've built an entire ecosystem and uh, your own building as well on the top uh, of, of another person's building while considering that person's building the bottom of yours, uh, you can't really complain when the bottom gets yanked out from under you. By the way, uh, during the act of building the Empire State Building, the real heroes are the steel workers that were putting in work. The, the ways in which they had to do their work were extremely dangerous, extremely stressful. Uh, they, they were always operating under tight schedules, and they didn't even always have time to put in proper safety nets. And sometimes, even the supports that they could build 
didn't seem terribly fit for purpose. Now, you know, sure, they got to have lunch, but they sometimes had to have, have the lunch in the office, as it were. And, uh, you know, construction of the Empire State Building, it started on March 17, 1930, and it went for 14 months. This building was rising at a rate of four and a half stories per week, which was a record speed. So 14 months after construction began, building opens. And it was going to have the world record for tallest skyscraper for the next 40 years. So notice how short-lived Van Allen's record was after all the, the work and the effort that they had put into it. Now, they completed this monumental feat with only, only five deaths. Um, and, you know, five deaths on record, when you look at the conditions these people were working in, seems pretty low, like, really. But even one life lost is too many. Next one we're going to talk about is the United Nations headquarters. Um, again, we're in New York. Um, now, the interesting thing about this building is uh, compare this building to the height of the previous building, and this building is actually like half, half the height. And yet, it took longer, longer to build. It was constructed from 1948 to 1952. That gives you some idea how quickly things moved on the Empire State. Um, now, the big thing about this building is it's all windows. Um, they had decided they wanted lots of light, and so everything had to be sealed windows. But you know what else is built with lots of sealed windows? A greenhouse, right? So the problem is that with light comes heat, and if you want the light but you don't want the heat, you have to figure something out. Because it really doesn't matter if your building is super pretty if nobody can actually stand to be in it. So the solution to this had started earlier, and it started in response to a problem that was encountered by a, a printing company in Brooklyn. Now, the printing company uh, was actually having a problem with their uh, paper getting wrinkled by humidity. And so then when they would ink the paper, there would be wrinkles, and they would cause the, the ink to come out misaligned. So a fellow had already come up with a solution for this. His name was Willis Carrier. He was an engineer that had worked to basically come up with a way to remove the humidity from the air. It happened to have the side effect of also cooling the air. And it worked by blowing air over a set of coils uh, filled with coolant. So he called it the apparatus for treating air, but we later came to call it air conditioning. Apparatus for treating air. So the first, the first space to use a similar kind of uh, technique to cool for human comfort was actually the New York Stock Exchange. And the guy that had designed that system was Alfred Wolf. The thing about the system that was used uh, there was, first off, it was very expensive, and it was also very heavy. This, this uh, device actually weighed 300 tons. So in 1922, Carrier had improved on his original design. He had added a centrifugal chiller. And what this meant was that it was simpler, it was smaller, and it was, most importantly, way more cost effective. So without this, a building like the UNHQ wasn't going to be able to exist. And this is really important because, yes, the technology existed before, but there's a big difference between it existing and being accessible. But again, now we're going to talk about the Willis, or we may have known it as the Sears Tower at one point in Chicago. Uh, Fazlur Rahman Khan was the architect for this building. Uh, and he was actually a structural engineer tasked with building an office complex for Sears, Roebuck, and Company. And they wanted to host all Chicago employees in one building. So this was going to have to be a very tall building. Now, Chicago is known as the Windy City, and it's not really known uh, as the Windy City because of the gusts off Lake Michigan. But the gusts from Lake Michigan can batter the city with winds of over, uh, over 55 miles per hour. Now, the taller a steel skeleton building gets, the more susceptible it is to bending in high winds. And so this, it creates a swaying motion that gives you a sensation not unlike seasickness. You can get seasick on the top of a, a very tall building. So Kahn had developed something he called a tube structural system, which doesn't look much like a tube, but in theory, it really was. It, it, it took the, ex the skeleton that we were used to, the steel skeleton, turned it into an exoskeleton, pushing everything out to the edges. And not only did this give you better resistance against wind, but it also uh, reduced the building's uh, uh, weight even further, and it opened up more use of the floor. You could have these large floors, like open office floor plans, for instance. We all love those. Um, and the thing about this is, is unlike this lobster, whose exoskeleton is not winning him any beauty contests, um, Khan's exoskeletons opened up new avenues for design of buildings that, frankly, turned buildings into art. And you were able, evolutions of this design were able to become very, very impressive over time. And the important thing here is that it wouldn't have been uh, possible to build this high if we hadn't got built up a thick shell to guard against the wind. Now, the Sears Tower was built using Kahn's bundled tube structure. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the same kind of tube construction, but a big bundle of them. 
Um, this was nine separate buildings of various height, and it used the same construction and bundled together. The end result was that even with wind speeds of over 55 miles per hour, the top of the Sears Tower only sways six inches. So it's interesting how multiple small structures working together can be more resilient than a single large building. But we're almost done, two more. First one we're gonna talk about of these two is Taipei 101. Uh, it was completed in 2004. It's built in Taipei, Taiwan, which you probably would know from the name. Taipei sits near the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is the most seismically active area on Earth. It gets hit by an earthquake about twice a year. And uh, earthquakes are very different than wind shear, right? Earthquakes, uh, they have a very strong effect because they affect the foundation of a building. And so a, an earthquake can literally break a large building. And this means it's pretty important to test against breakage before you erect a large building on, on a foundation. And so uh, it turns out that spaghetti models, like you might have built in science class at one point, they're actually, they model steel very nicely. They bend and break under similar conditions, similar ca characteristics. And so this is how they test them. This is so awesome. Like, I wish this was my job. <laughs> Seriously. You get to play with these models all day? Now look, the structure, the structure seems mostly intact, right? But if this had been a real building, that top floor would have fallen down and killed everybody inside. The structure was too rigid and it transferred too much of that vibration to the top floors. The industry, by the way, has a term for this kind of failure. <laughs> so, this is fun. Uh, it turns out that the only way that you can actually assure a lack of failure is to test for all modes. But the only way to know of all modes is to learn from a failure that actually happens. And so, it's not possible to be absolutely sure that any given structure is gonna resist any loading that could cause a failure. All we're really doing is figuring out that it's acceptably unlikely. Think about that the next time you're on the 30th floor of a, of a building. Someone, <laughs> someone's in charge of deciding what's acceptable. Um, so it's really important that we test to ensure catastrophic failure is acceptably unlikely and hopefully set, <laughs> hopefully set a good bar for that. Um, right. So the designers of Taipei 101, they, they made it rigid uh, where it had to be and flexible where they could afford to be. And this is a floor plan, for ty a typical floor plan for 101. You can see these yellow, uh, these yellow uh, dots on the, on the map here. Uh, they rep represent 36 uh, rigid steel tubes, including eight mega columns uh, in red. And these are all pumped full of concrete. And then every eight floors, there are these outrigger trusses that are essentially like big rubber bands around the building that allow the building to shake. Now, on March 31st, 2002, a 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit Taipei, and Taipei 101 was still under construction. It destroyed smaller buildings. Uh, it toppled two cranes from the tops of this building. Uh, but the construction ended up re resuming uh, without incident after an inspection said everything was fine. There was no structural damage. And in fact, the engineers said during a quake, Taipei 101 is the safest place in town. So you'd be surprised how flexible it turns out you can afford to be. Now, that flexibility is great for withstanding a quake, but you might imagine that making a building that's kind of strapped together with rubber bands has negative effects in the way that you can resist wind. Um, so if every time the wind gusted, everybody got sick, you probably wouldn't have any tenants. Uh, so it actually has three tuned mass dampers, and this is, uh, this is the biggest one. It's suspended from the 92nd to the 87th floor, and it weighs 728 tons. And what happens is, and this is during a typhoon last year, what happens is it swings in, in the opposite direction to sort of maintain uh, against the wind so that when the building is swaying, it's kind of pulling back in the opposite direction. And you know, it's really good when winds pick up to have something uh, at the top that's pulling for you. This talk? Oh. Right. And most importantly, uh, I wanna talk about the Burj Khalifa. It was uh, built in 2010 uh, and everything Everything that we've learned so far has been refined and improved and applied to make this building possible, but that's not actually what I wanna talk about when it comes to the Burj Khalifa. So after the attack of September 11th, um, it was actually discussed that maybe we wouldn't be able to build any super tall buildings anymore because the problem becomes one of evacuation. Um, if an evac in an evacuation situation, Stairs are really the only option, and it turns out that walking downstairs is almost as difficult as walking up them. And at twice the height of the former One World Trade Center, Burj Khalifa, they needed a plan to ensure the safety of people that were gonna be inside in the event of uh, uh, any kind of accident, really. 
And, you know, the building had a naturally fire-resistant concrete core, which, you know, that helps. But even so, as you build higher and higher, more and more people need to walk further and further to get to safety. So the big question then is, how do the people that are in the Burj Khalifa get out in an emergency? And the answer that surprised me is they don't. Um, it turns out that it's not just enough to give only one option to people who are in danger to leave the building. So what was done is that refuge rooms were built on the mechanical floors of the Burj Khalifa. They were built from layers of reinforced concrete. And they had fireproof sheathing. And the walls of these rooms, they, they can withstand the heat of a fire for up to two hours. And each room has a dedicated supply of air that's pumped in from uh, fire-resistant pipes. And by creating these safe spaces that are, uh, the people in danger are able to go, the architects make it more likely that people are going to survive a catastrophe. These spaces are every 25 floors or so. And that's important because it doesn't matter if the safe spaces exist, if, there's not, uh, if they're too inaccessible or if they're too risky to get to. Now, in a fire, you probably have heard that it's not usually the fire that, that kills you. It's the, it's the smoke inhalation. Well, if the route to a refuge room is blocked by smoke, then that room is, is no good. So the Borsh Khalifa, if anything activates a fire detector, a heat sensor, or a water sprinkler, uh, a network of high-powered fans kick in, uh, and they force clean, uh, cool air through these ducts into these rooms uh, to push the toxic smoke out of the stairwell so that the route to the safe room is clear. And it's important not to just provide the fresh air and the safe space, but to actively work to push out toxic elements in your building. And of course, none of this is a substitute for rescue workers. Um, the rescue workers still need to come to the aid of those people who are in the refuge rooms. Safe place is just a place for people to go while there are people actively working to resolve the issue and resolve the emergency. Because anything worth building is only worth building because of how it impacts people. Thanks, this uh, was not a talk about skyscrapers. Thank <laughs> you.